Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Suburban Rifleman. It is a cold and dreary day. It's hard to believe I was out here a week ago in a t-shirt, and it was 70 degrees almost, and nice, uh, very comfortable. Today it's cold and windy. I do have a dead cat on my sound recorder. Hopefully that cuts out most of the wind noise, but it is really quite blustery out here. If we were out on the ocean, we'd be in high seas, but um, I have a couple of hours today, so I wanted to get another borrowed rifle video out of the way. This one doesn't belong to my dad. Uh, this one belongs to my cousin, and as you can probably see from looking at it here, this is an absolutely beautiful, uh, perfectly pristine, unissued, number four Mark II uh, Lee Enfield rifle. So it was made in Liverpool at Royal Ordnance Factory, Royal Ordnance Factory for Zachary. And uh, it is in 303 British, of course. And I have no real experience with the number four Mark II. I've had a lot of uh, various incarnations of Lee Enfield rifles over the years. I have had number ones of almost every Mark in, uh, in both original military configuration and sporterized versions. I've had number fours, uh, mostly number four Mark ones or Mark one stars, I think. I had a really nice, uh, Canadian Long Branch, uh, which was also in unissued condition, but it was a late war model and it had a lot of the sort of manufacturing expedient uh, modifications made to it. The big difference with the number four Mark II is this was kind of the last hurrah for the Lee Enfield rifle. I'm not really sure entirely why they even made these. Uh, by the end of World War II, the writing was on the wall. Uh, semi-automatic rifles were the way forward. The FN, I think, 49, which was the precursor to the FAL, was already in production. And it seemed very likely that the Brits were going to go with some variation of the FN-FAL, which they did. Uh, they, well, they didn't adopt it as much as they adapted it. They made an, their own inch pattern version of the FAL, which was known in British parlance as the L1A1. Uh, but it seemed like before they stopped making Lee Enfields altogether, um, and to be clear, this is the last sort of official issue Lee Enfield. Um, I think some of the private enterprises like Birmingham Small Arms continued to build target rifles on the Lee Enfield action all the way into the 1960s, perhaps. Um, but this is the last official issue Lee Enfield, and I think they just kind of wanted to get it right they had identified a bunch of shortcomings uh, with the number four rifles during World War II, and then they had had to make some manufacturing cuts. And they wanted to build a rifle, I think, uh, without the stress of war, um, without any pressure, and correct a lot of the problems uh, that had popped up with the number four, as great as it was. Um, a couple of things are the trigger is actually hinged uh, on the receiver as opposed to being hinged on the trigger guard. One of the big problems with earlier versions of the number four was that the wood stocks were made out of walnut. I don't know if it was American black walnut or if it was English walnut, um, which is a beautiful wood and, and very good quality, but it it's sort of a loose grained wood and it has a tendency to, to swell and shrink depending on humidity uh, and other barometric conditions so um, the relationship of the trigger apparently and I'm no expert about this somebody else might want to comment on this the relationship of the trigger uh, to the bolt and the sear on the bolt would constantly be changing and it would sort of mess with the the harmonics the ballistic properties of the rifle um, so they mounted the new trigger directly to the receiver, and they did away with walnut stocks altogether. This is a beech stock. Um, beech is nowhere near so beautiful. I mean, it's not an ugly stock by any means, but beech is nowhere near so beautiful 
as walnut is. But the great thing about beech is it's very hard, it's very dense, and they kiln dried all of this wood prior to manufacturing the rifles, meaning they put the wood into an oven and literally baked all of the moisture out of the stock before doing the final machining and milling to make as dimensionally perfect a stock set as possible. And they made a bunch of other little changes um, to the stock to fine-tune the barrel harmonics. And although I am by far no, no expert on the Lee Enfield rifle, and I do not have a thousand yard range to shoot at, uh, I have it on good authority that these rifles, despite the reputation that Lee Enfields and the 303 British cartridge have for not being super accurate, these rifles are thousand yard rifles all day long. Um, you would probably want a scope mounted to shoot at a thousand yards. Although you might be able to do good work with this rear sight. This is a Singer rear sight. I've talked about these in the past. Uh, it's a micrometer adjustable uh, aperture that can go up and down anywhere from, I think I have it at its lowest setting right now, which is 200 yards, and that's where I'm going to be shooting. And it goes out to 1,300 yards. So the rifle is just in beautiful condition. It's absolutely unissued. Uh, it has the markings here, number four, mark two, F, uh, one slash 55. I'm assuming this was made in January of 1955. And PF, I don't know what that stands for. Probably something to do with Fazakerly. And the serial number, you can see the magazine has the rifle's serial number on it. Um, all of the broad arrow ordnance marks are in place. This rifle has essentially no wear. Now, I would never... Oh, and it's got an original uh, canvas uh, sling, which is dated 1940-something? 1948, 1946. It's hard to read. And also, my cousin has this wonderful canvas case. Um, the carrying strap on this one says 1943. Um, it's the whole, it's the whole kit and caboodle, if you will. And I would normally not shoot an unissued rifle like this, except my cousin has already shot it, and he has given me permission. Um, in fact, encouraged me to go ahead and shoot it a little bit. So, um, I think that's pretty much all I have to say about the rifle. Let's go ahead and shoot this thing a little bit. This is the same box of ammo I was using in my last 303 British video. Um, I have some hand loads here, which are fairly carefully um, loaded and relatively low uh, velocity, low pressure rounds. But I'm not going to put hand rounds through my <laughs> through a borrowed rifle. I, I'm confident in my hand loading skills, but not confident enough to subject. A borrowed rifle to it. I have some uh, Privy Partisan 303 British. I think these are 180 grain soft points. That's probably what we'll use. I have some older uh, Winchester Super Speeds. I think these are 180 grains as well. Um, we're not going to shoot this a lot. It is raining, it's foggy, uh, I didn't bring any paper targets. We're just going to try shooting at some 200-yard steel here, just to get a feel for the rifle. Um, I have no intention of getting it all sighted in or anything, it's not my gun. So I don't want to mess with the sights any more uh, than necessary. I have set my aperture to 200 meters, though, or 200 yards, uh, which is the range. So let's go ahead and shoot this a little bit. We'll start off with this Privy Partisan. We'll load three rounds. You've got to be careful loading a, a Lee Enfield, especially if you're not using stripper clips to avoid rim lock. But a number four Mark I was the first rifle I ever owned. So I have a lot of experience with these rifles. So I guess, with no further ado, let's do it.
I didn't feel like walking my nice clangy plate of AR-500 up to the 200 yard line so we're just shooting at the crampy old iron stove plates that they have out there but hopefully we'll be able to hear it and hopefully I'll be able to hit it this has the solid brass butt cap on it so No cushioning for your shoulder. Not sure where that hit. I don't think I hit the plate. And we're not going to put a lot of effort into this. I don't want to expend a lot of ammo. If not necessary. Especially if I don't know what I'm hitting. But that's the biggest plate out there. And I think it's about 16 inches square. We'll try it again. Man, the rain is really coming down now. What a perfect day to shoot a British rifle. Try holding a little lower. Maybe these maybe these sights are set for 200 meters and not yards. I think I did hit the gong that time. We'll have to listen to the audio to see. Load another three. Oh, I still have one in there. Let's try one more with that hold point. Holding a little bit low. Yeah, I believe I heard that that one hit. Again, the audio will tell the tale. Let's try... Brass looks good. Doesn't look overly stressed. Let's try a few of these Winchester super speeds. Let's see if they give us any different results. Not that this is a particularly scientific test anyway. Then we might call it quits. I could shoot this rifle all day, but I don't want to put too much stress on my cousin's essentially brand new 70 year old rifle I'm sure I heard a hit but this rain is coming down really in sheets now. I can barely see that target at 200 yards. Let's try again. Oh, I definitely hit the gong that time. I can see it swinging. That was a solid hit. 
to be shit. I right, still got two rounds left. Let's see if we can duplicate that. That was a nice hit. Definitely holding a little bit low at 200 here. <laughs> oh. Now I'm going to have to take a walk in the rain. I just took that plate out. There's another one up there, though. Let's see. We'll shoot this last round. Again, I don't want to put my cousin's rifle under a ton of stress. Here we go. Oh yeah, hit the hit that other gong. So anyway, hopefully this wind noise isn't too terrible. I'd like to thank my cousin for lending me this beautiful example of a number four Mark II. Um, he's been talking about thinning out his collection. I hope he's not thinking about getting rid of this. Um, if you are, we're, we may have to discuss terms because I'd hate to see a rifle like this go down the road. Uh, this would be worth selling a few things, but uh, if I were you, I'd hold on to it. So, anyway, just a beautiful old rifle. It shot fairly well. Um, I at least hit the gong a couple of times. Man, is it coming down in sheets now. So, I guess we'll wrap this up and I'll start working on my next video. Uh, when I post that, I hope to see each of you here then. Later, guys.